Hey, what up guys? My name is HB and welcome to part 2. I'm gonna continue my breakdown of my track Age of Aquarius, so let's go. Okay, so before we go to the drop, we actually have the leads that are playing in the buildup. And the reason why I have them in the buildup is to uh, introduce the, the melody of the, of the drop, but also to better transition between the break and the drop. And of course, I have the leads being filtered in the buildup, slowly opening up, as you can see here with the EQ. The reason why I have so many channels, as you can see, we have main saw, lead, final, and all that. I'll explain that once we get to the mix stage. So I'm sorry if this looks a little bit confusing, but trust me, it will all make sense. So we have two leads and I chose this saw lead to play in the buildup because the other lead that I have here, even though it plays first in the drop, I thought it would be a bad idea to have that lead play in the buildup because it's going to clash with the other super saw element that we have in the uh, in the buildup. So that's why I chose this saw lead to play instead. Uh, it's in an octave lower, so it doesn't interfere with anything really. And this is how it sounds. And right about here, it starts to open up, but also go up in pitch. I have a pitch automation as it goes down in volume as well. Now, if I go here, we can see that this lead is actually made out of two layers. This is the main layer. We have this saw wave with two voices and the random phase is all the way down, meaning that it's going to start from the same position. And the reason why I did that is because I wanted it to sound good in mono. But besides that, we have this filter here, this notch 12 that is giving it that nasally sound. As you can see, I have the cutoff at this position and I have LFO one in envelope mode that is modulated it slightly giving it that extra movement and as you can see here I also have the mix at about 50% but remember in part one I talked about sometimes when you're using filters you lose a bunch of data and I didn't want to lose a bunch of data with this so that's why I chose to go with 50% just to give it a little bit of notch over here in this frequency area and this is how it sounds so far Now, what helps it sound even more nasally is this distortion that I have here. Also, I have multiband compression after that. But here, I'm actually using the filter in the distortion. I'm using it in the pre mode, which means that it filters it before the distortion kicks in. And I use the rectified distortion because you can see the drive is at 45%. The mix is at 55. Once again, the reason why I didn't go with 100% is because if I did this, then I would lose a bunch of information information. Which might sound cool, but that's not really the sound that I was going for. So that's why I brought the mix to 55% and this is how it sounds. Now, there's not a lot of stuff going on with the second layer. It's just a super saw, 16 voices, a lot of detunement. And we also have a band pass over here with the mix at 35%. We have LFO1 modulating the cutoff, just giving it that extra movement. Also making it sound a little bit nasally, so it gels well with the other layer that we have here. This is how it sounds on its own. But that's pretty much it. It just only exists to give it a little bit of stereo information to the second layer. It helps fill up the frequency spectrum a little bit better. And together they all sound like this. Now, if we go here, you'll see that I have a little bit of post-processing. The main thing that I, I want to talk about is the utility in Procube. The utility, as you can see, I have the width going down at 80% instead of 100%, meaning that I'm making the overall sound a little bit more mono-ish. And while I'm doing that, I'm boosting it by 2 dB. So essentially what I'm doing, I'm just boosting the mono information by a little bit. Because when I was mixing this lead, it got lost a little bit within the overall mix so I just wanted to boost it a little bit so this is a really good trick to keep in mind if you guys ever encounter a lead that you have or some element that you have that gets lost a little bit when you hear the overall mix in mono so you can always do this uh, whenever you encounter it now the second thing that I'm doing is I'm cutting all of the low frequencies that we don't need because we don't want them to clash with the 
kick and bass, but I'm also lowering this range of frequencies that are around the 2K and I'm using the large Q to do that because usually when you use uh, sounds like this, sounds that sound nasally, they tend to have a buildup around this area. So I just took a bunch of that out and this is how it sounds without. So you can hear that the sound still sounds nasally, but we got rid of a ton of nasty frequencies that we don't need. Now moving on to the other lead that we have here that actually plays first at the drop, we have this super saw lead. So what we have here is we have two oscillators with a saw wave, 16 voices, and they're being heavily detuned. Also what's controlling the detunement of both of the oscillators is LFO1 in envelope mode that's going really fast just to give it like an initial attack of detunement. But besides that, we also have envelope one, which is giving it a little bit of attack in volume. As you can see here, the sustain is going down by 2 dB, but that's pretty much it. There's nothing more to this sound. It's, it's, it's very basic. In the Post processing, as you can see, I also have this utility trick that I showed you with the other layer. I felt it was necessary also with this layer. Usually when you use sounds with a lot of voices, they tend to get lost within the mono field. So usually I would use this trick on sounds that have a lot of voices. There's no reason to use it on sounds that have just one voice because it's already in mono. And I also have Pro Q here cutting a lot of the lows, this time a little bit higher because it's playing at a higher octave. And I'm also lowering down this range range of frequencies around the uh, 2k area and as you can see I also have this really narrow band that is lowering down this specific frequency my approach to doing stuff like that is to not look for problems if there aren't any I know a lot of people suggest that you would do something like this and make it really narrow and then go search for any problematic frequencies I don't do that I think when you're in the mindset of looking for problems you're gonna find ones you're probably gonna find ones that aren't even there you're gonna make problems so that's why if i don't hear anything I, I don't i don't go in and do stuff like that but in this case i did hear that was a lot of uh, uh this frequency just popping out really loud so i had to take it out i'm, I'm only taking like 4 db so i'm not doing a whole lot on it really my approach when it comes to eqing sounds like this is to do as less as possible i don't want to lose a lot of information i want to keep the the information from the original sound so yeah once again only if there is problems you go in and do stuff like that so that's why you see a lot of times when i'm eqing stuff i'm using like uh, really wide cues instead of narrow cues Another interesting element that we have in the drop is this tsunami pluck. It just reminded me of the pluck sound from Tsunami. And this one is a very interesting patch. As you can see, we have also a lot of post-processing. So what we have here is a saw wave with 16 voices. We have also a square wave with 16 voices. We have a little bit of detunement and oscillator A and oscillator B being the stereo layers. We have the main mono layer, which is the sub. We have a triangle wave that is two octaves down and all of them are being filtered by a low pass. The filter is being controlled by L Alpha 1. Alpha 1 is also controlling the volume of some of the oscillators. We also have a pink noise layer just to give it a little bit of attack. And we also have LFO 2 modulating the overall pitch, just giving it a little bit of more movement to the sound. And what I'm noticing now, we have envelope 3 that is controlling the level or the volume of the sub oscillator. And usually I wouldn't use the envelopes at all. I will only use envelope 1, which controls the overall volume of the whole serum patch. The reason why I don't tend to use the envelopes in Serum is because you can use the LFOs and you can get very specific with them if you choose the BPM settings. I don't really like using envelopes with milliseconds for the, the, the measurement. It just doesn't like I don't want to calculate how much milliseconds is 16 note in 128 BPM. So I don't want to do all of that calculating. I find it very easy to just use LFOs 
foes instead. Besides that, we have a little bit of processing here. We have chorus, we have distortion and multiband compression. And the overall thing sounds like this. So it's already sounding decent, but I have a little bit of post-processing. I have Pro-Q cutting all of those lows and dipping this range of frequencies around the 2K. And I have Saturator that is heavily distorting the sound. And then we have an EQ just to get rid of some of those high frequencies that the saturation introduced. And then we have a delay, but I'm using it more as a Huss effect. As you can see, I'm delaying the right channel from the left channel by 7.33 milliseconds. The reason why I chose this specific number, and as you can see throughout the project, there's a bunch of specific numbers that I'm using. Those numbers, what I'm basically doing, I'm just converting the BPM of the, of the notes to milliseconds you can google a bpm to milliseconds it will show you a bunch of converters and that's what i did i just calculated what is the millisecond equivalent of a 128th note within 128 bpm and if i'm not mistaken that is 14.65 and i divided that by two and i got 7.33 milliseconds so that's why i chose this specific number you'll see it throughout the project there's certain elements that I'm using those specific measurements. But yeah, so this is how it sounds with the delay on it. And last but not least, I'm using a utility that's going to make it 100% in stereo. I'm trying to lose all of the mono information so it won't interfere with the other elements that I have in the drop. And this is how it sounds. Now, after I did all that, I just bounced it into audio and he, here's a quick tip when you're working with stuff that has a lot of voices and a lot of stereo information and have choruses and flangers and phasers, stuff that's going to mess with the, the, the phase of the sound. The tip is to record a bunch of instances of that sound and then choose the one shot where everything aligned perfectly or almost perfectly and then use that throughout the uh, the. the track and that's exactly what i did here i just rendered this whole block as you can see we have four shots here of the sound and out of the four i chose the one that sounded the best out of all of them okay so i went ahead and rendered this to audio so you guys can see what i'm talking about just want to give you a, a quick example so i just rendered all of this into audio and just to show you how i would choose the best one shot in this example there's not much of a difference visually as you guys can see there's a little bit of it of a visual difference between this one and this one but overall they kind of look the same sometimes you have more of an extreme visual example like as you can see right here sometimes you'll have something looking like this so you can tell right away that this doesn't look good so in this example they kind of look the same but when i play it to you you can hear the difference between the two This one sounds more open and this one sounds a little bit more closed. Now it depends on what you want to achieve with the sound. Now if we zoom in, you can really see what's going on within the waveform. You can see that we have some sort of a, of a thing going on here where it's like super congested. This one looks kind of kind of okay. Where if we go to the second one, you can see that here it's pretty much pretty smooth all the way. So that's how I went about it. I just chose the one that looked the, the best, but also sounds the best that's the more important thing i was just looking to find the best one shot and if you don't find like the perfect combo you can always just choose one you know and then pair it with the uh with the other one like so and then you have the best of both worlds but yeah that's how i would approach this type of thing so besides the leads that are playing on the drop, we also have this distortion vocal that we talked about in part one. I'm just, what I'm doing here, I'm just continuing to let this play out throughout the drop, but I'm just lowering the volume on it. So it's not really at the front of the mix and more in the back. And while it's playing in the drop, I have this auto pan over here in 16 notes. What that does just gives it a little bit of movement uh, within the stereo field, just sending it from left to right really fast. The reason for that is because it sounds cool, but also just to make some room within the mono field to the rest of the elements that are playing in the drop.
Okay, so real quick, I want to talk about all of the white noise and sweeps that we have in the project. I forgot to mention that during the break, but also the buildup, we have mainly we have two layers of white noise. We have the, the sweep down and the sweep up, and they're both the same. All I did was to just use operator over here, and I'm just using the white noise from it. And I have this instance of EQ8 that is being macro controlled over here. And what it does is just filtering it. And the difference between the sweep down and up is one is closing down and the other one is opening up, as you can see right here. So the sweep down is the same thing, just the opposite way. And another layer that we have here is this white noise exhaust. And that plays when the drop hits. The reason I'm using it just to emphasize the impact of the drop and uh, add additional hype to it. And the last white noise element that we have here is this white noise sidechain that is playing throughout the drop, but also in the intro and outro of the track. And what it is, is just white noise. Once again, I'm using operator and I'm taking out all of the low frequencies and uh, keeping the high frequencies intact the way they are. And I'm applying this volume shaper that we have here as you can see i'm taking a lot of the volume initially but then it builds up and then i'm taking all of the volume out And another element that I forgot to talk about is the uplifters that we have here. Besides having white noise layers that indicate when stuff are going down or going up, we also have uplifters and downlifters. Starting with the downlifter, we have this sample that plays out throughout the track. Really, there's nothing special to it. It's just a sample that I found. Uh, I'm not doing any crazy processing to it. But here we have the uplifter that I'm making from scratch. It's a serum patch. And all it is is just saw wave, 16 voices, heavily detuned. And I'm controlling the filter throughout macro one. So as you can see here, I have this automated to open up as it goes along. But I also have here a high pass that is filtering all of the lows and it's being controlled by macro one as well so as it goes along it's filtering all of those low frequencies that we don't need and this is how it sounds And I have that just playing repeatedly throughout the track whenever I need to build some tension. So in order to create some more movement within the drop and to make it a little bit more interesting, we have a bunch of drum fills and drum elements that are being added. The first one being is this drum fill. And once again, nothing special going on here. It's just a sample that I found and I'm not doing much to process it, but it's really important to have layers like this to spice things up. I guess some people will call it ear candy. And in my opinion, those stuff, even though they're not really important, they're not the main thing that you hear, they're, they're more in the background. But I think when you add stuff like this, it, it makes a track sound more complex and makes it more interesting to listen to. But as I was saying in part one with the sound effects, try to not overdo it. Just use it here and there to spice things up, but nothing more than that. We also have this zap sound. Uh, it's not really a drum element, but I use it as such. What it is is serum over here. It's just a saw wave that it's being pitched down from really low to really high and then really low once again. And all I did to it is just take this range of frequencies. Once again, I think the most problematic area of frequencies within any track, in my experience, is the 2K range. Between 2K and, and 3K, that's the most problematic range of frequencies. The reason why I took so many out, because the sound is being pitched up and down, so it has a lot of activity over in this range of frequencies. So that's why I took a lot of it. But then when we have this part of the drop where it the, where the main saw lead is playing. We have this layer of claps that are being introduced. 
and I have this LFO tool that is just sidechaining it a little bit, taking a little bit of the volume before every hit so it can make room for the transient of the kick. And I'm just using this clap layer to spice things up and to make everything sound a little bit more hype because in this section of the drop, we have the, the lead that is playing in an octave lower and that brings a little bit of the energy down. So I decided to use this clap in order to bring the energy back up. And as we transition to this part of the drop, we have this section right here that is kind of a throwback to the break that we had. So we have some of the elements that were playing during the break. And then we have additional layers that are being added to the second part of the drop. We have this Hoover sound that is playing. And I'm using that to add more hype to the second part of the drop. And once again, I'm using saw waves with 11 voices, uh, a lot of detunement, and really that's it. There's nothing more going on. And adding to the hype, we have these toms that are playing also in this part of the drop. And I'm using two samples. The first one is this. And as you can see, I'm doing a lot to it. For starters, I'm making it mono. I'm losing all of the stereo information that it had. And I'm also taking a lot of the low frequencies that we don't need. So it won't clash with the kick and the bass that we have. But the main thing that I'm doing is I'm shaping the sound and I'm automating the cutoff to cut all of the high frequencies as the sample plays out. The reason I'm doing that is because I just didn't like the way the sample sounded without it. So this is without. So as you can hear, there's a lot of high frequencies that are just lingering throughout the, the sample. So I'm just getting rid of them without losing the main hit at the beginning. And I'm doing the same with the second layer as well, while also here getting rid of a lot of the stereo information. There's just a lot of low end stereo information that I didn't like in this layer. So as I was saying in part one, sometimes you don't get the perfect samples that you need, but you can always spend a little bit of time on it to perfect them. But I will say this, if sometimes you came across a sample that you kind of like, but it has a lot of issues and you spend a lot of time figuring out how to solve those issues, I think in that case, it's just not worth it. You just need to either find a better sample or create the sample from scratch, as we did in a lot of elements during this track. If you remember in part one, we created the snare from scratch. The reason for that is because I just simply couldn't find a snare sample that fit with my track. So that's what I will do a lot of times. It's not that I'm against of using samples. It's just sometimes it just gets frustrating when you can find a perfect sample and you find something that sounds kind of close to what you want, but then you got to work on it like a lot in order to make it sound good. So if I can perfect a sample, I will do that as I'm doing here with those two. But if it was too much to handle, then I would just delete it and either try to find a different sample or just create the tom sound from scratch. But I think there's a good thing that you get from doing these types of things is that you learn a bunch of techniques along the way, like using the EQ as a filter like that. That, that is something that I would never think of doing unless I came across a sample that absolutely needed that. So I think there's also a good value in, in trying to figure out how to make sample work. But yeah, overall, we also have uh, post-processing for the two layers. We have OTT. We have Pro-Q once again, cutting a lot of those lows, making sure that there's no low frequencies that will clash with the kick and the bass. And we also have this saturator just to glue those two sounds together and make them sound as one. And I also have this group over here. I have one channel without, so that's the dry signal. And here we have the wet signal, which is a delay, which is that delay trick that I showed you earlier doing the Haas effect. Basically at 100%, we have the right channel being delayed from the left channel by 14.65. As I told you, that's the equivalent of 128th note and 128 BPM. And then finally, we have an EQ because I just want that stereo information within this range of frequencies. I don't want the high frequencies. I don't want the low frequencies. I want the mid frequencies. And this is how it sounds. 
So essentially, we're just adding some stereo information to the sound. And to top it all off, I have this LFO doing the same thing that it does with the clap, just taking a little bit of the volume every time the kick hits. Okay, I almost forgot about this part uh, of the drop where we have the djembe drum. I believe that's how you pronounce it that is playing in the drop. This section of the drop, the whole thing shifts into triplets and this is how it sounds on its own. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on here, but mainly we have this drum that is from a contact library. Uh, I believe it's uh, the Africa Sounds, World Sounds. You can see it right here on the screen. I have it. But even though this is not sponsored, I would highly recommend that you get not only the Africa pack that they have, but also the India one. And there's one from Cuba. Uh, and I think also another one from the Middle East. If you are a producer that is looking to incorporate these types of elements and sounds into your music production, Production, I would highly recommend you get those and native instruments are pretty good about having a bunch of sales so you can look for a discount that's how I got mine that the, they were all on a discount a huge discount so the sound itself from contact was already good but there was one problem with it it was too staccato-y and too short so what I end up doing is just bouncing it into audio and going inside of each note as you can see right here and just stretching it out I believe if we take the warp off it looked something like this so as you can see huge difference between this and this uh, the reason why i wanted to elongate the uh the the note is because the whole quote-unquote meat of the sound is over here uh that's where all of the tone and resonance is really lying inside i can show you with and without so this is with So as you can hear, doing this really brings out the tone out of those drums. Now I have two of those djembe drums. One is one sound and the other one is a totally different sound. You can choose within the contact library. I wish I had it up here so I can show you, but they're the same drums, but they just have different tones. And if I'm not mistaken, this one is also slightly uh, detuned or maybe just in a different note, uh, but this is the main one. And this is the one that is adding additional tone to it. But even after all of that, they sounded like they were a little bit lacking. So that's why I added this layer. So as you can see, it's just a sine wave, but what it's adding, let me show you if I go over here. So this is just the drums. And this is just the sine wave. And this is the both of them together. So as you can see, it's just adding this low frequency over here around the 200 frequency. And also while listening to it, I thought that it could use a little bit of more high frequencies, a little bit more of attack. So I added this another serum layer that is just white noise, as you can see right here. The white noise is being filtered and the LFO is modulating the filter. Now we do have a lot of uh, post-processing on this. I'm going to take all of these off and let you hear how it sounds without. So first off, we have OTT. We have Pro-Q3 that is cutting a lot of the lows, but also adding over here where, where the meat of the sound was, all of those uh, tonalities from the drums. So I'm just boosting that area of frequencies. But we also have some two problematic frequencies that, as you can see here, I'm using uh, narrow bands to get rid of them. But also what I'm using, instead of just lowering them regularly, like using this. So I'm using this feature where it reacts to the sound and ducks it every time there's a, a boost in that frequency instead of just lowering down the, the whole frequency. The, the reason why I'm doing it this way is because sometimes you might not want to lower the volume on a specific frequency all the time because not all of the time there's a problem with it, only in certain hits. So that's why you would use something like this. So this is with Pro-Q. As you can see, the EQ is reacting to the audio and this is without. After that, we just have that delay effect that I showed you earlier. So all I'm doing here is just once again, just adding an additional stereo layer to the sound. After that, I'm distorting the sound. 
and I'm adding this delay and reverb and I'm using a very short delay time uh, as you can see there's no feedback and the Valhalla room is set also to like a really fast decay so I'm not really trying to add huge atmosphere to it I'm not trying to make it have like a long tail I'm just trying to add a short tail just to give it a little bit more sustain and release to, to the sound really it's the same thing that I was getting at with just elongating the the notes over here with the warp and as you saw earlier i also have effects on the the, the samples themselves i forgot to talk about it once again all i'm doing is uh here i'm just getting rid of the uh, the high frequencies and here i'm getting rid of the low frequencies and boosting this area but really what i'm doing is i'm trying to saturate it and distort the sound to get those resonance and the, those those tonal harmonies out of the sound and after the distortion i'm trying to make sure that there's no uh, low frequencies that are being added to the sound and I'm doing the same thing over here with this layer as well but yeah that's really it for the djembe drum and that's it hopefully this was helpful for you guys let me know in the comments down below i know that i said that i'm gonna be talking about how i made the kick and bass and also show you how i mix and master while i was recording this episode i felt it was taking too long and i don't want to rush it so what i'm gonna end up doing is i'm gonna record a third part to this uh, breakdown series and i'm gonna show you there how i mix and master making the the kick and bass from scratch i think it's better that way i just don't want to rush it and, and gloss over some stuff i really want to go into details of how i do stuff and why i do stuff i think there's a lot of value there so that's the reason why i didn't get to do it in this part it just takes a lot of time to talk about all the different elements within the track and explain the the thought process behind each and everything so that's why i'm deciding to do it this way but if you do have any questions or stuff that you want to you want to know stuff that i didn't go into details regarding the stuff that i was talking about in part two but also in part one you're welcome to join me on my live streams on twitch i stream every sunday around 6 p.m gmt plus two time my username is the hb that's t-h-e-e -E underscore hb so feel free to join i'm always down to help i want to answer all of your questions if you do have one and as always you can find links to the free downloads at the description below you can download all of the different presets of the different sounds that i was showing you in this part and besides that i guess i'll see you around for part three make sure to, to stay tuned you don't want to miss out on that and i will see you guys later bye